Pastor Jeff Turner, and you're listening to another message from Sound of Awakening Ministries. For more information on this ministry, please visit us online at www.jeff-turner.org. Acts chapter 17 and Romans chapter 1. Acts 17 and Romans 1. So let's just jump right in tonight. Let's go to Acts 17, verses 22 through 30. This message is called, In Him We Live, part two. So, In Him We Live, part two. The Bible says, Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. And now what you worship in ignorance, I am going to proclaim to you. Just a real quick setup here so you know what's going on. Paul is obviously preaching in Athens, which was a hub of paganism, which was a hub of temple prostitution and immorality of the day. It was not a city you would drive into somewhere in Alabama in the Bible Belt. This was Sin City, okay? This was a hub, a capital of temple prostitution, pagan sacrifices, pagan temples, you name it. If it was scummy, if it seemed like the slimy underbelly of the idolatrous world, that it was probably going on within the walls of the city of Athens. And Paul is preaching in this grimy environment and an environment that most modern day Christians would not even dare enter without having 40 days of prayer and fasting, without sending a team of 120 intercessors to fast and pray and plow up the ground and open the heavens before entering. This is the kind of city that Paul is standing in and speaking, and he's speaking quite boldly. And he does something really interesting. He walks around and he looks at all their idols, all their objects of worship, and in the verses preceding it says he was grieved over them all, but he's looking at their idols, all the different gods they've made for themselves to try to explain different phenomena, all of, all of these different gods they've fashioned for themselves to try to, uh, to try to put a face and an image to the different things they felt and the different emotions they had and the different things they saw at work in the universe. He's looking at all of these different expressions that they have created out of their own fallen minds to try to describe what they felt and what they saw. And he's looking at them all, and there's a host of them. And then he comes to this one, and it's not a statue, it's an empty altar, and inscribed on the altar are the words, to an unknown God. And Paul says, you Athenians, man, you blow me away with your religion. I am absolutely blown away by how religious you guys are. Because you don't just have a God for everything under the sun, you've even got altars built to gods you don't know yet. Just to be safe, you've built an altar to an unknown God, whose name you don't know, whose nature you don't know, you don't know anything about him, but you just assume there's got to be more out there than these clowns that I worship that act more like hormonal teenagers than they do deities. So we're just going to build an altar here and say this is to an unknown God because we know there's got to be more than these guys. So just to be safe, here's the altar to the unknown God. And Paul says, now what you guys have worshipped in ignorance, I am about to proclaim to you. That little passage of scripture blows my spiritual socks off because Paul says, this God whom you don't even know, you've built an altar to him and you just call him an unknown God and the only reason you've built an altar to him is because you feel there's something out there in the universe greater than you. You feel that there's something out there greater in the universe than these gods of gold and stone and wood that look more like you than they do gods. You know there's something more out there than this. And so you've just said there's got to be more. So here this al- here's this altar to this unknown God. And Paul says, now what you have worshipped in ignorance, I am about to proclaim to you. Because you have worshipped a God who is in fact real. You just have not known his name and you have not known his nature. But I don't want you to be ignorant anymore. I'm going to proclaim to you who this God is. And then he goes on in verse 24 and he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he doesn't live in temples built by the hands of men. Verse 25. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. And from one man he created every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. And God did this for this reason, so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, even though he is not far from each one of us. Paul says, look, this God whose force, whose life, whose energy you feel pulsating and vibrating in all of creation, this unseen force that you can't describe, that you can't put a name or a face on, 
this unseen force that you feel in your relationship with your wife and kids and in your relationship with the city and in, in your relationship with the earth, this unseen life force that you feel when you inhale and when you exhale and you're like, oh, when I breathe, something burns in me. I feel alive. I feel like there's, there's more than just flesh and bone and blood. I know there's something more than all of this. He says, that God who gave you breath, that God who determined exactly where you would live, that God who determined the time slot in which you would live, that God is the God of heaven and earth, and he's not worshipped by, he's not worshipped, he doesn't dwell in the temples made by men, and he's not served by human hands, and this is the God whom you've worshipped in ignorance. God did all this stuff for you. God created you. God lets you feel his life in your breath. God lets you feel his life in where you live and how time plays out. God God lets you feel all of this so that you would begin to seek him and reach out for him and find him because he's not far from any one of you. Paul says to the pagan of the pagan, God is not far from you. He says to the most wicked of the wicked in our eyes, God is not far from each one of you. And in the church today, we say God's on this side of a great chasm and you're on this side of a great chasm and Jesus came and built a little bridge so you could make it over to the other side. But Paul says, even to you pagans, God's not far from each one of you. In fact, he's in your breath. He's in the breath you breathe. He's in your everyday life. He's not far from you. And God did this. God, had, God inserted you where he inserted you. And he inserted himself in all of your circumstances in the hopes that you would begin to seek him and find him and discover who he truly is because he's not far from you. You know, God probably had a lot of people who knew who he was outside of Israel in ancient times. Israel was God's special chosen people, but there's probably tribes in the middle of nowhere who knew the true and living God because they felt something Oh, and they didn't know how to explain what they felt. And they'd dance around fires and cut themselves and make gods and, and scream at the skies and offer sacrifices and do everything they, they could possibly do trying to discover who this was and what this was that they felt. It says God did this. God put this thing in you. He puts you where you are and put what's in you in you in the hopes that you'd seek him and find him because he's not far from you. I'm sure there's tribes in the middle of nowhere who punctured that artery and discovered who the real and living God was on their own. Just because, because God's, the Bible says that's why God did what he did. Not just so Israel could know him, but so that all nations could know him. And Paul's standing in the midst of Athens, the most pagan of pagan cultures, and he's like, listen, guys, what you feel in your everyday life, what you feel when you inhale and exhale, what you see all around you, that force you feel that you don't know what it is, but you build altars to it, and you call it an unknown God. This is the true and living God, the God, the Lord of heaven and earth, that God who's not far from you, even in the midst of your idolatry and your paganism, he's still close to you. He's not far. And then he says this, Verse 28, because in him we live and move and have our being. A quote from a pagan poet named Epimenides who was a prophet of Zeus. And Paul says, this guy didn't even know it, but he was speaking by the Spirit and prophesying to you by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. <laughs> in him we live and move and have our being, even if some of your own poets have said, we are his, off his offspring, Qu quoting the pagan poet Eratus, another pagan <laughs> And Paul says, this guy didn't even realize it, but he was speaking by the Spirit. And what Paul is saying is, look, Athens, there's an unseen thread that runs through your everyday lives, and it's the Spirit of God. It's that God who's not far from you. There's an unseen force that's woven into the fabric of your lives, and it's the presence of God. A God you don't know. A God who right now you're worshiping in ignorance, calling him an unknown God. You acknowledge he's there, but you don't know him. You acknowledge his presence, his energy, because that's, all, that's the only way you know how to describe it, but you don't know his name, you don't know his nature, you don't know who he is. In fact, it's in him that you live, move, and have your being. You know, before anyone knew what oxygen was, they still breathed it in. <laughs> right? <laughs> before anybody knew what oxygen was, they still lived off of the stuff. Right? I don't know what this is, but <sighs> sure does keep me alive. Before anyone knew what electricity was, they experienced it. When they'd build up a little static charge and touch something, and like, oh, whoa, must be the lightning of Thor. I mean, they'd give all kinds of names to it and ascribe all kinds of things to 
they were experiencing electricity. Now we know what it is. Now we know how to harness it. Now we know how to heat our homes and light our buildings with it. They experienced it even before they knew what it was. And that's basically what Paul is saying. He's like, you're experiencing the presence of the true and living God in your everyday physical lives. You just don't know what it is yet. And you call it an unknown God. And you build altars to it because you feel its presence. You feel it when you breathe. You feel it when you live. You feel it when you move and when you work. You know it's real. You know it's there. And you know, these clowns that you call gods and goddesses aren't the answers. So you build an altar to it and you call it an unknown God. Because it's in this God that you live and move and have your being. Even if you're not aware of who he is, you're still swimming in him. Even if you're not aware of who he is, you're still living off of this stuff. Hear what I'm saying? You know what that means? That's that, that one cool thing that means, it means that God never separated himself from humanity. The way we say that he did. The moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God was like, done, I'm done with you. No more communion until Jesus comes. No, the Bible says that it's in him you live and move and have your being. P- pagans. In fact, your own poets who are pagans and who are prophets of Zeus prophesy things that are going to be included in scripture. And they thought they were speaking about the spirit of Zeus. Surprise, surprise. It's in him you live and move and have your being. You don't even know it but you're overshadowed by him. You don't even know what this stuff is, but you're breathing it in. It's keeping you alive. You just don't know what it's called. You call it an unknown God. But I've come to bring him out of obscurity and make him known to you. And then Paul says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring... Wait a minute. Pagans? Idolaters are God's offspring? Don't make no sense. (laughs) I thought it was only to those who believed on his name that he gave the right to be called the sons of God. Yeah, there's a difference there. Yes, we are sons of God because we believe, but you know, even the pagans out there are God's offspring. His image still lingers in them. His nature is still there. They're not totally depraved. The whole doctrine of total depravity that says until you get saved, there's nothing good or pure of God in you at all. That's not found in the Bible. Paul says to pagans, you are God's offspring. And he says, since we're God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. He's like, if we're his kids and we move and see and talk and hear, we shouldn't think that our daddy is a frozen statue. Right? In other words, this God's real. He moves. He lives. He talks. He speaks. If his kids do, of course he does. You didn't get this from stone or wood. Since we're God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. Paul says in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. What ignorance? What did he say? You have worshipped the true and living God in ignorance for years by feeling him but calling him an unknown God. But I've come to make him known to you. Paul says in times past, God overlooked this kind of ignorance. He said, I understand you don't have a revelation of me and it's okay. I won't judge you for your lack of understanding. But now, because of Jesus, he commands all men everywhere to repent. You know what repent means? Repent doesn't mean throw yourself on the floor, roll in sackcloth and ashes and scream until you feel forgiven. Repent means change your mind and see things differently. Paul says, God used to overlook this ignorance, but now he's calling you to see with a new pair of eyes and see this God whom for, whom, who formerly was unknown to you is Jesus. And I've come to unveil to you who this force is that you felt in everything, but you haven't had a name for. His name is Jesus. And he's the God of everything that you can see. He's the one by whom and through whom all things were created. And Paul brings them out of their ignorance brings them into a place of revelation. Now, what's the whole point of that? What's the whole point of me telling you that? You're not pagans. You're not idolaters. You don't don't worship an unseen force and build altars to unknown gods. Or do we? Because what Paul is saying to them is, the way you've worshipped this God is by living. The way you've worshipped this God is by moving and being. Because it's in him that you live and move and have your being. You've worshipped him in ignorance simply by existing. Because you don't exist outside of him. You don't live outside of him. You don't move outside of him. You don't breathe outside of him. Therefore, to live, to be, to breathe, to move is to worship him. 
Because it's his presence and his energy and his life that you're doing it in. You don't know his name. You call him an unknown God. But still, you're moving and living and having your being in him. You just don't know who he is. You're doing it in ignorance. You're doing it in ignorance. You're worshiping him in ignorance. But now I'm unveiling the fact that you're not living and moving and having your being in some unknown omni-being in the sky somewhere. His name's Jesus. He's the real and living God. I'm unveiling this to you. What Paul says to them, you've been worshiping him for years just by existing and just by being but now I'm showing you who it is that you've been living and moving and having your existence in. What does this say? What Paul is saying to them is everything about your life, from the inhalation of oxygen to the exhalation of carbon dioxide, everything, from where you live to when you were born to when you die, everything in your life is touched by this God and everything that you participate in is worshiping him because everything in life is done by him and it's all in his presence. Everything, no matter how physical or carnal it seems to you, is actually spiritual at its core. The nucleus of everything you experience is Jesus. You just haven't known it. You've been ignorant of it, but you've been living and moving and having your being in him. And now I'm just unveiling who it is you've been living and moving and having your being in all along. What's the lesson of that portion of Scripture? Even pagans live and move and have their being in the presence of God. Even pagans are called God's offspring. Even pagans, every nook and cranny of their life is crammed with Spirit of God. How much more so is that true for you and I who are called sons and daughters adopted into his family? How much more true of that, true of us is that if it's true of pagans and idolaters? Are you guys hearing me? If everything in the Athenians' lives were spiritual, how much more is everything in our lives spiritual? And you say, I don't worship an unknown God, but the truth of the matter is most of us do worship an unknown God because we have church as our spiritual time, we have our devotions as our spiritual time, we have our prayer time as our spiritual time, but everything else is physical. Working, going to school, being a son, being a daughter, being a mom, being a dad, being whatever it is you are, that's physical, this is spiritual, and our lives are chopped up into these little sections. This is my God life, this is my normal life and most of the time is given to normal life and so we feel more fleshly than we do spiritual and there's constantly this battle between the natural and the spiritual the natural and the spiritual and what Paul is saying to the Athenians is every aspect of your life is all spiritual it's all one and the same you can't get away from it there's no such thing as a spiritual realm and a physical realm it's all one and the same you're living and moving and having your being in the spirit all day every day I just want you to acknowledge it I just want you to wake up to it and when you wake up to it and when you acknowledge it you're entire life becomes prayer your entire life becomes worship if you'll simply acknowledge god in everything that you do instead of ascribing it to an unknown force it's just unknown i'm just no 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 it's in him you live and move and have your being do you guys understand what i'm saying to you tonight what i'm saying to you is your life is spiritual like i'm just not the spiritual type i'm not you know so and so is spiritual so and so is spiritual they're always praying always worshiping fast and doing all that kind of stuff they're really spiritual but i'm just not really spiritual. I'm more, you know, I like to think and I like to read or I like to do this and I like to have fun. And I'm just not as spiritually minded as this person is. No, you're extremely spiritual. You just don't know it. There's nothing you do. There's nothing you enjoy that isn't spiritual. If it's twisted, if you've allowed it to become perverse, that's one thing. But still, at the core of who you are, the nucleus of who you are, it's spiritual everything about you. There is nothing secular in your life. There's nothing carnal in your life. There is no such thing as a line or a division between the natural world and the spiritual world. We're the ones who drew that line. We're the ones who put that fence up, but God never did. You guys with me? Okay, let's go on here a little bit. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's invisible qualities, qualities his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse the bible says that god's invisible qualities and those qualities include his eternal power and his divine nature that's a lot of stuff right (laughs) the eternal power of god and the divine nature of god that's a lot of that's a lot of invisible qualities and it says all of those invisible qualities have been made plainly known to men how so through creation that everything there is to know about god in a sense can be known 
by observing His creation. You know what that means? Creation is the spirit world with clothes on. Creation is the spirit realm with clothes on. You know, if someone's wearing clothes, thank goodness you can't see what's underneath, but you can still see the form of the person through the clothes. Right? Someone's wearing clothes, you can't see what's underneath, but you can still see the form of the person through their clothes. And in the same way, the Bible says God's eternal power and His divine nature has been plainly made known through creation. That means that creation is the spirit world with clothes on. God's made Himself known through His creation. God's made Himself known through everything you can see. That's what Paul says to the pagans. You guys are out there laying on your back on, a, on, a, on some dew-soaked grass on a starry night and you're looking up into the heavens and something in your chest is burning like a campfire and you're like, my God. And you feel that terrified feeling of there's something more than me. In Him you live and move and have your being. Of course there is. <laughs> Everything is spiritual. God's in the stars. God's in the trees. God's in the sound of the wind that you hear blowing through the leaves that puts chills down your spine and you feel like there's more to it than just... Wind rattling foliage. <laughs> That's the Spirit of God. His eternal power and His divine nature is there. Paul says you just got to acknowledge it. You just got to realize that's what's going on. You got to realize that's what's happening. You got to realize that the events of your life aren't just happening because, you know, God just pressed play 6,000 years ago and everything's just happened. It's, it's God moving and living and having his way in you. It's God breathing through you and out of you. It's, it's all part of the river. It's all part of the dance. Paul says, just stop and realize I'm dancing with somebody here. I just haven't known it. Okay. God has made himself plainly seen through creation, meaning that even creation, even creation that's now fallen and under a curse is spiritual. Everything. Everything. Everything your eyes have ever beheld is spiritual at its core. All right. Colossians 1.17 says, In Jesus Christ all things consist. You know what consistency means? Consistency is like what holds something together. You ever made... I was making cookies last night with my daughter. Made some mean peanut butter cookies, mind you, from scratch. Pretty impressed with myself. Got to say, I was making these. And you know what? I just keep, keep stirring up the batter and adding the different ingredients and just keep stirring until I feel it's the right consistency. And if it's not, I'll add a little bit more flour, add a little bit more of this. And, you know, I just make sure it's the right consistency, that it's holding together properly. And the Bible says that all things find their consistency in Jesus. All things are held together and find their consistency in Him. All things, fallen and unfallen, are held together by Jesus. That means everything in the universe at its core is Christ. Because if he ever ceased to be for a moment, all things would cease to consist and hold, be held together. That means everything at the center is Christ. All things. There's nothing that all things doesn't include. All things find their consistency in him. All things. Creation displays his eternal power and his divine nature. He's everywhere and he's in all things. He just wants us to tune in to what's out there. Proverbs chapter 8 verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And what? In all of your ways do what? Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In all of your ways do what? Not beg for him to come into it. It doesn't say in all of your ways, make sure before you do anything, you stop and you beg the Spirit of God to come into the midst of your circumstances. It doesn't say in all of your ways, pray about it. In all of your ways, pray and fast and make sure you're including God in your plans. It just says, no, in all of your ways, acknowledge that God is already present. In all of your ways, acknowledge that he is what's holding it together. He's what gives it its consistency. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And as a result, your paths will become straight. You know what a real relationship with God is? A real relationship with God isn't begging Him to come into the midst of your life. It's acknowledging that He's already in the midst of your life. A real walk with God, real prayer, isn't going around begging God to become stronger in my life and do this and do that. It's acknowledging He's already there. It's communing with Him through what's around you. That's why Jesus shows up on the scene and sometimes He's quoting from the Law of Moses and sometimes He's quoting from the valley and talking about flowers. That's why sometimes Jesus is quoting from the prophets and sometimes he's talking about seeds. <laughs> sometimes he's, he's quoting the, the law and, and, and waxing eloquent using Old Testament scriptures and other times he's talking about birds. Because God is as clearly seen in creation as he is in the scripture. 
His eternal power and His divine nature are clearly seen through the things which are in creation. You know, sometimes you just got to stop. You're like, I want a deeper spiritual life. I want more. I want to hear from God more because this guy's always hearing from God and always having visions. You know what? Sometimes you need to just stop and say to yourself, all things have their consistency in Christ. In Him I live and move and have my being. Where is God in my life right now? He's not out there. He's right here. He's all around me. He's in everything I'm seeing and touching and feeling and tasting and smelling. He's everywhere. He's in all things. There is the... There is the possibility for me to commune with God everywhere and anywhere at any moment. In Him you live and move and have your being. It's a matter of changing your perspective. In the church, we've been trained to see the evil in everything. In the church, we've been trained to see what's bad and evil in everything. We've been, you know, all the spiritual warfare nut jobs, it's like, you know, you see demons in everything, demons in everybody, and demons in that person, and demons in the other person. Some people train themselves to think that way, so when they walk down the streets, they consciously try to see, oh, those people are so oppressed by demons. They're so oppressed. There's demons of this on them, and demons of that on them, and oh, they're so oppressed, and oh, over that business, there's demons, and over that, there's demons in darkness, and oh, there's a serpent coiled around that building, and some people live that way, you know? It's like either give them medication or give them a, a typewriter and let them write fantasy novels, but please don't pray for me or prophesy over me, <laughs> okay? But instead of doing that, what if you start seeing th- things the way Jesus sees them? Instead of saying, we're his offspring, and God's in that guy right there. <laughs> yeah, you might be demon-possessed, <laughs> but you know what? There's something redeemable about this guy. I see the heart of God in you. I see the beauty of Jesus in your face. Come on. See, in that way, you're never cut off from communion. But when we're in moments of darkness, when we're in places of darkness, we succumb to the darkness, and we get swallowed up by it, because darkness is all we can see. But Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. For what? They will see God. Those who are pure in heart, those who have a new nature in Jesus, those who are born of the Spirit, those whose hearts are no longer clouded by some sinful nature and by some old man, they have the ability to lift their eyes up and see things from another perspective. They have the ability to lift their eyes up and stand in the midst of Athens and say, God's not far from each one of you. They have the ability to look at idols' altars and say, ah, this was actually built for Jesus. You just didn't know it. They have the ability to read pagan poets and say, this guy who was saying in Zeus we live and move and have our being, what he actually was talking about was the true and living God who gave you breath and everything you have. The pure in heart have the ability to see God in all things. You know, I choose to see God in all people. You know, that's what real prophecy is. Real prophecy isn't seeing what's bad about someone and bringing it to their attention. Real prophecy is seeing treasure in people and bringing it out. When you start prophesying over someone, you're digging down deep and you're finding treasure they didn't even know was in themselves and you're bringing it up and you're like, dude, did you know this was in you? Like, no. You're discovering and uncovering gifts that were in people when you're prophesying over them. You know, we were taught for years in church that prophecy is just yelling at people and ripping them up one side and down the other and telling them how bad they were. And prophecies always and words of knowledge are always, there's someone here who's bound in pornography. There's someone here who won't forgive their grandma. There's someone here who, who, who hates their mother. And everyone, you know, when anytime anyone starts moving in the gifts, everybody gets nervous because they're going to call out my junk. Well, what if we had real prophets that knew how to call out the treasure in people? What if we had prophets who knew how to look at someone who is dark and dirty and bound and all kinds of stuff, but instead of just telling them what they already knew about themselves, I just see that you're dark and you're bound. They're like, well, that's cool. I already knew that. What if you could dig down real deep and bring treasures and hidden potential out of that person's heart and bring it in front of their face? I'm like, did you know this was in you? You know what? I forgot all about that. Maybe I am worth something. Maybe God does have a plan for me. Maybe I'm not hopeless. You know? That's what real prophecy is. It's for edification, exhortation, and comfort, the Bible tells us. Not ripping people to shreds and making them feel like dog poop. Sorry. We've got to learn to see with a new pair of eyes. God used to overlook this kind of ignorance, but now he calls all men everywhere to repent, to see things differently, to change their minds, and see things through a new set of lenses. feel like you don't have a close relationship with God, feel like you don't have a close walk with God, feel like you're not as close to Him as others, you're as close to Him as you can, you can't even imagine how close to Him you are. All of creation is pulsating and vibrating with His life. God's not speaking to me. Everything that there is to know about God is made plainly visible to us through creation. Man, like Jesus, just stop and look at the birds sometimes. (laughs) You know, creation is the spirit world with clothes on. 
Listen to this, man. Okay, think about this. Think about the angels. The Bible tells us there's, there's, there's these four cats in heaven, okay? These four living creatures. And one of them looks like an ox. One of them looks like an eagle. One of them looks like a lion. One of them looks like a man, okay? Now, if you go to the creation account, Job tells us that the morning stars all sang together when God created everything that's created. What does that mean? That means angels were already created and they existed when God created us and when he created the animals and everything that can be seen. The angels were already in existence when God created. Okay? That means there was an angel in heaven that looked like an ox, that looked like a man, that looked like an eagle, and that looked like a lion. So the truth of the matter is, these angels don't look like oxes, lions, men, and what one did I miss? Eagles. Oxes, lions, eagles, and men look like angels. Because they existed before we did. And if the natural world is a copy and a shadow of the spiritual world, that means what we see down here has its partner there. In fact, it might not necessarily be have its, has its partner way up there. It has its partner here because creation is the spirit world with clothes on. Do you get what I'm saying? That's an amazing thought. It does so because like when, when people have a vision, they're, like, they're just talking from their own heart. It looked like an ox. Or did the ox look like the angel? Look like a lion. Or did the lion look like the angel? Because what came first? The angel existed before the animal did. God was pulling from what already existed, giving it a face in the natural world. So that when we saw it there, we'd have something to compare it to. Right? The natural world is the spirit world with clothes on. You see, God's speaking and he's in all things and he's always declaring himself to you. We got to have it spooky and mystical before we get it because we haven't learned to acknowledge him in all of our ways that's what the bible says acknowledge him in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths things will start unfolding before you. you're going to start realizing whoa see you never have to have a dry moment in your life people go from hills and valleys hills and valleys i'm on top of the world i'm the king of the world in jesus and now i'm sinking in the murky waters of the titanic wreckage i mean you know you're the king of the world one day jack next day you're going down you know i mean that's how so many people are in christianity they're up one day and they're down the next they're on fire and they're not because they don't feel like they have a consistent union a consistent relationship a consistent hearing of his voice that's because we don't acknowledge him in all of our ways we only acknowledge him in some of our ways and the only ways we acknowledge him in are the ways that take place when we're in church or when we have a bible in front of us or when we're in our set aside time of prayer but it's in him you live and move and have your being every moment of your life is spiritual Acknowledge him in all of your ways. All of your ways. Find God in everything. Some people say, you know, the devil is in the details. You ever heard that statement? You ever heard that phrase, the devil's in the details? No, the truth of the matter is God is in the details because all things consist in him. You get close enough, you get down deep enough, you're going to find Jesus burning as the central flame of all things. Okay. You guys with me? Is it making sense? Let's move along. I'm almost done. See, I'm saying this to you tonight because on, on Sunday I preached it, and the way I preached it was to a crowd of people that maybe is so spiritually minded that they don't know how to enjoy themselves anymore because everything has to be spiritual. They don't know how to enjoy themselves. I don't think with, with, with youth and young adults that's so much the problem. We know how to enjoy ourselves. We know how to have fun. The problem is we don't know how to do it and maintain our walk with God. We don't know how to do it and bear in mind the fact that I'm not stepping out of his presence to enjoy myself and to have fun and do things that are just life things. I'm not stepping out of him to do that. I remain in him and it never ceases and I'm in one constant flow of conversation with him. It never ends. It never stops. You know, that's what I'm saying to you guys is you don't ever have to stop. It's not 10% of your week is spiritual because you're praying or at church. 100% of your time is and you have the opportunity to commune with him in all things. You have the opportunity to commune with him in all things and fellowship with him in all things. If you just acknowledge him in all things. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15. Brother Lawrence, that great dishwashing Meal cooking monk of yesteryear once said these words, one of my favorite quotes The presence of God is the concentration of the soul's attention on God, remembering that He is always present. The presence of God 
is the concentration of the soul's attention on God, remembering that he's always present. I grew up thinking the presence of God was what came into the room when we worshiped for two hours. And it was like we buttered God up for two or three hours with worship till finally he was like, oh, I better get down and hang out with them kids. They're just going to sing all night. And so it's like finally he hit hour two and a half and just like, after like two, we were just kept worshiping, worshiping, and the presence of God just exploded in the place. It was amazing. It's like, I was there when you walked in. You just built yourself up to a place where you had an emotional oh, explosion, and that's totally fine. But you don't have to wait till two or three hours into a worship set to experience Him. The presence of God isn't something that comes down when you get the song right or when you get the atmosphere right or when everyone's hungry enough. The presence of God is what you live and move and have your being in. And Brother Lawrence, this monk who knew a thing or two about a thing or two, said the presence of God is actually just the concentration of your soul's attention on Him, remembering that He's present in all things. The presence of God isn't a substance that you step in and out of. It isn't something that comes down and goes up. It's what's always around you. And the sensation of his presence that we experience is when we concentrate the attention of our soul on the reality that he's always there. That's why Brother Lawrence said, he says, the time of business and the time of prayer don't differ to me. When I'm in my kitchen and there's dishes clanking and everyone's screaming orders back and forth, he says, I possess God like deeply in my soul, and I'm, un, I, I'm unmoved by anything. It's, 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 it's as real and spiritual then as it is when I'm kneeling and taking the blessed sacrament, he says. Because he knew the secret. The presence of God is the concentration of my soul's attention on him, remembering that he's always present. See, it's in him you live and move and have your being. Everything is spiritual. What's, what, what's available to know about him is plainly seen through creation. His eternal power and divine nature is made known through that. The natural world is the spirit. The, the, spirit, the natural world is the spiritual world with clothes on. It's always there. It's always available. You can commune with him at any moment. And every it, It's always around you. It doesn't have to stop. It doesn't have to cease. You just focus. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll direct your path. In all of your ways, acknowledge that I'm living and moving and having my being in his ways. And when I acknowledge his ways in all my ways, a whole new world opens up before me. You know? And I used to press in and 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 press in for the presence of God. And I'd never find it, never find it, never find it, never find it, never find it. Now that I realize I'm totally at rest and I'm only called to acknowledge what's already there, I stay, I mean, I'm out of my mind half the time in His presence. I can't, I just, I can't help but smile. I can't help but laugh. I can't help but lose my mind because I, it's here. <laughs> I'm never dry. Never a dry day again. You're like, well, yeah, you'll get over that in about three months. I'm not talking about something I've been on for three months. I'm talking about something I've been on for years and years and years. Because I've learned the secret of acknowledging him in all my ways. Living, moving, having my being in him in all things. The presence of God is the concentration of the soul's attention on God, remembering that he is always present. Colossians 1.15 says this about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Athenians, this unknown God whom you worship, in ignorance, I'm going to make him known to you. It's Jesus he is the image of the invisible, unknown God whose energy and life force you feel in everything in the universe but whose name you don't know. Jesus is the image of that invisible God. Let me bring you out of your ignorance and let me show you who you've been worshiping all of your life by living and moving and having your being. Let me show you who's been behind it all. Let me show you who the nucleus of it all is. It's Christ. He's the image of the invisible God, the first born over all creation. And the really interesting thing about Christ is that when you read about him, you're not reading about some disembodied spook who moves around on some golden cloud on some celestial sphere somewhere in the netherworld. When you read about Christ, you're talking about someone who wears flesh and blood just like you. When we talk about Christ, we're not just talking about Casper, the friendly second member of the Trinity out there. We're talking about a man with eyeballs and flesh and bones and blood and toenails and fingernails. For real. 
We're talking about a man who's alive, who has a pulse, who has a heartbeat. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about Christ. And it says Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now there's something really cool hidden in that. Because Christ is the word made flesh. Christ is God in a body. Christ is God living in what you and I live in. And we think that the greatest hindrance to the spirit of God in our lives is this thing that we live in called our bodies. Right? I mean, isn't that what we're taught? That the greatest hindrance to our spiritual lives is this physical frame we live in? And we got to keep killing the body, killing the body, killing the body. Now Paul does say, I beat my body, I make it my slave. I won't, I won't be ruled by my appetites. He says, I put to death the misdeeds in my body. I won't let my body and its impulses rule me. No, of course not. Sure, I'm not talking about all that. But, but you know, we, we, we think that our physical frames are the greatest hindrance to our spiritual life. And yet God himself came and lived in one. And in fact, still lives in one. Listen, if your humanity could undo your spirituality, then the incarnation of Jesus Christ would have undone the Trinity. But it didn't do it. (laughs) You know what that means? Our humanity is much less a threat to our spiritual life than we've ever imagined. Because Christ is the image of the invisible God, and Christ just happens to live in a body like you and me. You know what the word incarnation means? It means in the flesh, in meat. When God was incarnate, it means it's God with meat on his bones. It's God encased in meat, in flesh, in bone. That's what the incarnation is. Through the incarnation, what God did is he took our life on himself. He lived like us. And he comes down to the earth and he's hanging out with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, hanging out at their parties, eating huge meals with them, never accused of being a prude, always, in, always accused of partying too hard. That was the accusation that followed Christ his entire life. Not that he's too legalistic, but that he has too much fun with the wrong people. <laughs> I mean, that's the number one accusation that followed Jesus' life, and it had to have some grounding in reality because all accusations have some ground in reality. They're just exaggerated. John the Baptist was accused of being too ascetic, and he was. Christ was accused of being too eccentric and over the top, and he must have been. He knew how to party. He knew how to have fun. And the Pharisees just didn't dig that. But what Christ is showing us, hear me, isn't that God knows how to act like a man. Because that's not what happened to the Incarnation. The incarnation was not God acting like a human being. It wasn't God putting on a body and coming out and being like, man, there's a lot of fun stuff to do down here. I love this. I love your food. We don't have anything like this where I come from. This is so fun. This is so cool. I'm going to act like you guys. The incarnation was not God acting like a man. It was God showing us It was God showing men that we have been acting like God all along and we just didn't know it. The incarnation wasn't God acting like a man. It was God showing men that they've been acting like God all along and they just didn't know it. It was God showing us, it's in me you've been living and moving and having your being all along and you didn't know it. See, I'm God in the flesh. See, I'm the one who created you. I'm actually the nucleus that holds all of you guys together. And here I am hanging out with you, eating at feasts with you, having fun with you, going to wedding celebrations with you, and doing what you do. And I'm not offended by my own humanity. Because this isn't really humanity I'm displaying. I'm displaying the divinity that is still stamped on all of your souls that you express when you enjoy yourself. That you express when you love each other. That you express, come on now. It was God showing us what he was really like. Because the Pharisees had us all screwed up. And the religious system of the day had us all backwards. God's only in the temple. He's only behind the veil. He's not in the inhalation and the exhalation of everyday life. He's only behind the veil. Between the wings of the cherubim. And that's not even there anymore. He's he's with us in our synagogues. With our rule books. 
He's with us building fences around the law. Making bigger and better rules to make us feel superior. That's where he is, but he's not in the nitty gritty of your everyday life. And Jesus, God himself, shows up and proves to us just the opposite. Because God's right there in the midst of all the dust and all of the grime, and he leaves the Pharisees in his wake. Do you see what I'm saying to you? God is showing us, look, we're really not all that different. What I want you to do is acknowledge me in all your ways. What I want you to do is acknowledge who this unknown God is, who you've worshipped in ignorance for centuries. I just want you to begin to acknowledge me. Then when I look at my wife and I feel that love in my heart for her, that's not just human. When you look at your husband and you feel that love in your heart for him, that's not just human. When you're enjoying yourself and you're, and you're looking up at the sky and something explodes in your chest, it's not just human response to something beautiful. That's me. Listen to me. There is one circle and one source of fun, enjoyment, fellowship, creativity in the entire galaxy, and that circle of fellowship is the Trinity. And everything we feel of that nature comes from that circle. It can be perverted by men with depraved minds, sure. But it has its genesis in the family of God. In Him we live and move and have our beings. Jesus comes down to show us, look, I'm not like these Pharisees. When you see me hanging out with them, it's really only to mess with them. (laughs) Whenever you see me hanging around the Pharisees, it's really only just to mess with their minds because I just have fun with it, showing us that God also likes to have fun with religious people. He's like, that's really the only time you're going to find me hanging out with them because I'm just not down with that. I'm down with you in everyday life. I don't have to call you all to my church building and have stained glass and a microphone and a three-piece suit to teach you anywhere you want. You want to go to a field somewhere? We'll go to a field, whatever. I'm just, I'm not religious. I have not, I don't need all this. I'll teach you right here. You want to go fishing? Let's go fishing. Yeah, you're not doing so good. Here we go. Cast over there. Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the God we all feel, see, and hear in the vibrations of the galaxy, but we don't know its name. It's in Christ. And Christ shows us what? He shows us God as a man. He's, he shows us God, a God who acts like a man, but really what he's showing us is the fact that men, at the heart, act like God. Just as I said, the four living creatures don't look like a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. Men, lions, oxes, and eagles look like the four living creatures because the four living creatures predate this creation. And in the same way, God didn't look like us. We look like him because he predates us. See, that creation that his eternal power and divine nature can be plainly seen in isn't just the trees and the moon and the stars. It's us. And Christ is the image of the invisible God because he's a man who acts like a man. And he says to us, look, this is not so hard. This isn't climbing a mystical staircase to reach divine union with the light. It's recognizing and realizing that in the everyday, daily grind, God's there. In the midst of all that, acknowledge him. In the midst of all of it, you know, in the midst of the hard stuff, in the midst of the easy stuff, it's God, he's all in all. I live and move and have my being in him. You know, it's not climbing the staircase until I reach that shaft of light and then I become one with the light and now I'm spiritual. I mean, that's the kind of way we paint it in the church. It's like, you know, praying and fasting until, oh, I get, oh, and then I'll find God. I'm ascending the hill of the Lord. Oh, I'm ascending and I'm getting weary because I've been ascending for years and I'm close. I can feel it. You haven't moved an inch because God never called you to climb no ladder. He's been with you every moment. But we're thinking, he's up there. The Bible never portrays God as up there. It's always portraying God as here. (laughs) I'm not out there. I'm not up there. In fact, Jesus said, beware of people who come to you and tell you he's over here. (laughs) He's here somewhere. He's in this building. He's moving over here. He says, beware of those kind of people. He's like, the kingdom of God's not out there. The kingdom of God is within you. 
Beware when people tell you, you got to go here, you got to go there, you got to ascend, you got to go down here and get this anointing. No. The kingdom of God's right here. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. This is so much less complicated than we've made it. It's so much less complicated than religion has made it, guys. You are spiritual even though you don't know it yet. If Christ is the greatest expression of the invisible God, and Christ is a man, then God looks an awful lot more like us than we think He does. Meaning, He's not afraid to hang out with us and rub shoulders and be in the nitty-gritty and the dirt and the grime of our everyday life. That's why He's Emmanuel, God with us. That's why the angels... They, you'll name Him, you know, His name will be called Emmanuel. Why? Because it means God with us, not God outside of us, not God trying to reach us, not a God we're trying to reach, but God right here with us. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge Him. <laughs> it's really easy. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. No, I added a few words, and I took one word away. Let me try it again. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. The illustrious firstborn Christ Jesus. No, once again, I missed a word and I added a few adjectives. Hold on, let me start over again. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. Let's try and trim it down. The God-man, Jesus Christ. No, I still added a word in. I didn't take one away that time, but I added one. Let me try again. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. The Bible says there's one God and there's a race called men. And there's one mediator between the race of men and God. And it's the man, Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean he's the referee who keeps us from killing each other. Okay? It means he's the bridge that brings both worlds together. Because humanity and divinity are in perfect harmony in him. Showing the race of men. It's cool, guys. My father's okay with your humanity. If he's okay with mine, he's okay with yours. And the Bible specifically says there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Because guys, Jesus continues to be a man right now. He didn't get beamed up and then drop his body and leave it behind. You know, when he ascended, there wasn't a steaming pile of flesh left behind. They were like, whoa. He took it with him. Brought it right into the Trinity. Sat down at his father's right hand. In a body like yours and mine. What does that say? God accepts people like us into the family. And that's the image of the invisible God. A God who's in the midst of us. A God who's in the midst of our flesh and bone and blood and everyday circumstances. A God who's in the trees. A God who's in the wind. A God who's in my body. That's the unknown God, Athenians, that you've worshipped in ignorance for years. You felt him in everyday life. You just haven't had a name for him. God used to overlook such ignorance, but now he commands men everywhere to repent. So let me give you a new set of eyes. It's Christ. It's God in you. It's God with us. It's God who's not afraid to become one with us because God's not afraid of us. And so we don't have to be afraid of him. You want to know what he looks like? Look to Jesus who's a man and God in perfect harmony. It's in him you live and move and have your being. And there's one more great mystery, Colossians, that I'm going to tell you, Paul says, in Colossians 1, 26 and 27. He says, The mystery has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but it's now disclosed to the saints, to us. I'm going to put that in there. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The great mystery of all the ages that's been kept hidden, that is now revealed through the gospel, is that it's never been the desire of God to dwell outside of us and have men trying to purify themselves enough to earn them a seat next to him. The great mystery kept hidden from the beginning of time is that it's always been the will of God to dwell right here in us. And that's now disclosed to the gospel. Christ in you. Not only does Christ live in his own physical body, he lives in my physical body. 
If he can live in his own physical body, he proves to me he's not intimidated by my humanity. Therefore, he can live in the midst of my humanity. Christ in me. See, I live and move and have my being in him. Even when I don't know it, even when I'm not acknowledging it, even when I don't have a name for what oxygen is 6,000 years ago, it's still keeping me alive. Even when I don't, don't know what electricity is, if I rub my feet on the floor the wrong way and touch something, pop, I feel it. I don't know what electricity is. I can't harness it yet. I don't have a name for it, but I know it's real. Just because I don't know what it is doesn't mean it's not real. Doesn't mean I'm not moving in it. And in the same way, just because you haven't become aware of the fact yet that Christ is in the midst of you, in you, not just in creation, but in the head of his creation, which is us, just because you're not acknowledging it doesn't mean it isn't so. The manifestation comes when you start acknowledging him in all of your ways. When you say to yourself, I refuse to live one more day of my life simply as a natural person. I refuse to live one more moment of my life with this great divide existing between the spiritual world and the physical world. That's not in the scriptures. It's never communicated in the scriptures. It's only communicated in modern Gnostic Christianity. That's more influenced by pagans and Greek philosophers than it was by the apostles and Jesus himself. I'm going to rip that line right out of my life. I'm going to destroy the border. I'm going to tear the fence down. I'm going to take that wall down and see the line between physical and spiritual begin to blur into one beautiful portrait. I'm never again going to live my life with a separation between the physical world and the spiritual world. I'm going to let them start bleeding into one another until I can't tell where one ends and the other begins and one begins and the other ends. I'm pulling the wall down. I'm pulling the fences down. I'm firing the guards and I'm saying I'm bringing these two worlds together and I'm acknowledging from this day forward Christ is not up there Christ is not out here Christ isn't in this building and I have to wait to meet with him you know and I only meet with him one or two days out of seven a week no he's in me he's not in here do you understand that when we exit this building Jesus isn't hanging around here waiting for us to come back on Sunday I mean, that's the way I used to think as a kid. I mean, if I'd come to the church, like as a little kid up north when my dad had to, you know, do something on an off night, I'd be afraid to look in the sanctuary. Because you know, like, Jesus is going to be there glowing in the dark. You know, I I mean, have you ever been to a church when no one's around? You know, when you're, have you ever been to a church like when the lights are off after hours? Anybody but me? The sanctuary is like the place that freaks every little kid out. Because that's where God lives in our mind. And if you look at the front, you know you're going to see some creepy Catholic statue-looking Jesus standing there going, (laughs) you know, glowing at the front of the altar. And then when he sees you, he's going to be like, (laughs) and fry you or something. So you just don't look in the windows of the sanctuary at night. It was just always creepy. Listen to me. God's not hanging around here when we're not here. It's Christ in you. It's not, there's a portal that's been opened in the heavens over this certain city because the saints prayed enough. No. That's not the way the Holy Spirit deals with us. It's Christ in you. It's not that a hole's been torn in the sky over a building somewhere. And now the Spirit just can't help but pour through because there's, there's a hole. And if you want it, come and get it because there's a hole here. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in me. <laughs> it's God incarnate. It's God with flesh on. It's God dwelling in my humanity. Do you want to know God? Do you want a real intimate walk with Him? Then stop looking for Him. Stop looking for that experience outside of yourself. Stop looking for the golden ladder you can climb so you can ascend into some place in the Spirit and realize you're already absolutely 100% saturated In Him. Every moment of your life, you're living and moving and having your being in Him. Listen to me. Now, to the the thrill seeker, that sounds a whole lot less epic than these massive highs. That sounds a whole lot less epic than let's gather enough people to pray and we're going to tear a hole in the sky.
but it works is the difference. (laughs) It might not sound as epic, but it actually works. And that is the grand difference. (laughs) That's the litmus test of truth. It's what works and what doesn't work. And praying enough till we rip a hole in the sky doesn't work. But living and moving and having our being in a God who takes up residence in the midst of us, that works. Where's God? Not there, not there, not there, right here. In the midst of the daily grind, in the midst of everyday life. Getting up for school in the morning when it's the last thing I want to do, God's in the midst of that. Getting up for work in the morning when it's the last thing I want to do, God's in the midst of that. When you're a little bit older, paying your bills and you don't feel like doing it, God's in the midst of that. Going to the church service when you're screaming your guts out and worshiping, dancing like a maniac, God's there but no more than he is when you're at home paying your bills. I always say, I'm as anointed to cut the grass as I am to preach the gospel. There's no difference between the two as far as I'm concerned because my fathering is no more spiritual than my pastoring. The maintenance of my lawn is no more spiritual than the reaching of the nations in my mind. And if I keep my mind that way, I'm going to keep my mind saturated in him at all times. If I don't think that way, I'm going to go on highs and lows. God's here! Real life. God's not here. Tuesday night. God's here! Woo! Wednesday morning. Where'd he go? (laughs) Nowhere. We're just trained like Pavlov's Pavlov's dogs to drool when we hear certain bells. We're We're trained to respond to certain atmospheres, certain sounds, certain looks. And so... When you're in a building, the lights are right, the worship. Oh, the presence of God just came in this place. No, he didn't. He didn't. He did not. You just became aware of something that was already there. Because you're trained to feel him then. But what if you can retrain your mind to feel him at all moments? I feel God. I, I haven't felt God as much in a church service as I have taking my daily jogs ever. I've, and I've been in some pretty intense services. I've never felt him more than I have just in those early morning strolls. Walking and running my hands through the weeds, grabbing handfuls and crushing them. I just do that when I walk. And just feeling God, like, God, oh, everything's so alive with you. <sighs> Looking at the sunset, smelling that smell. And I love it when I get to a moment when I can hear no unnatural sound. When I can't hear the highway, when I can't hear a car, it just, it's nothing but the sound of creation. It was, man, everything is throbbing with the life of God. And then in those moments where I don't have that atmosphere, when it's life screaming at me from every angle, it's right here. If you don't learn to live like that, if you don't learn to live like that, if you don't learn to walk like that, you are doomed to failure. You are doomed to just be what Christianity looks like. But if you can get that, you look like the kingdom. Folks, heaven isn't Heaven isn't day and night before the throne. For a certain class of angel it is. But my Bible tells me when heaven comes down, it's a city in which there is no temple. Have you read that? Have you read that? When John says, I I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, a city like a bride prepared for its groom. And he says, and I didn't even see a temple there because a lamb was its temple. What does that mean? Heaven is city life in the context of God, who's all in all. It's not city life and then we go to the temple. It's not doing our duties and then we go up to the temple. It's living in the context of God, who is the temple. The whole city has become his temple because he's all in all. But it doesn't cease to be a city. And it doesn't cease to partake in metropolitan city-like activities. Heaven is living in the context of God. It's Eden. 
And that's what's coming down to the earth for physical men and physical bodies to live in. Fellowshipping with a physical king and a physical body. Come on! That's the kingdom. But we've got this, get rid of the body, get into the spirit. That's Gnosticism. It doesn't jive with the New Testament. The New Testament is Christ in you. God in the midst of all this. In him you live and move and have your being. And folks, I'm going to tell you, man, it's pretty fun too. Heck of a lot more fun than all the New Age Gnosticism I used to dip my head in and try to drink from. You want to talk about the mystical light? I am the light! Jesus said, you are the light of the world. I'm not ascending up. If I'm doing anything, I'm just digging in. Come on! What? Jesus ascends. The angels come. They said, stop trying to find him up there. He'll come back the same way he went. Go in the city. Receive the Holy Spirit. And realize he's not up. He's in. It's not climbing up. It's digging in. It's not escaping the earth. It's embracing it. Because that's where God is. That is the gospel. That is the secret kept hidden from the beginning. Is that Christ has always wanted to dwell in you. Not outside of you. I say we come out of our ignorance as to who this unknown God is, whom we feel. But it can't be God. It can't be God when I'm washing the dishes. It can't be God when I'm doing this or that. That's not God's stuff. God's only in the services. He's only in the prayer stuff. He's not. Yes, he is. In him you live and move and have your being. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and you'll see it manifested. Just calling you to the real deal calling you to a real life of spirituality that does not chop up the physical and the spiritual, but embraces them both as being one and the same.